Welcome here this afternoon for this quite amazing panel. Quite amazing because of the panelists more than everything, but also amazing because of the subject, Museum as Citizen. It follows an arc that has been developed here at the Aspen Ideas Festival over the years. Last year, for instance, Anna Devere Smith and uh, Damien Watzel had a whole program that Thelma was very active in that was about the artist citizen or the citizen artist. So it was about the individual. And this year, we extrapolated to talk about art institutions and in particular museums. Yesterday, there was a great panel that was moderated by Jamie Bennett. I'm sure that some of you were there, where we spoke about arts institutions in general and communities. And today, we're going to tackle museums, this new, old, idea of institution, and we have some titans of the museum world here with us today. I'm going to start from your far right, that's Heidi Zuckerman from the Aspen Art Museum. Many of you will be very familiar with her work. Right to your left, her right, is Lisa Phillips, who's the director of the New Museum in New York. Comes next, Glenn Lowry, director of the Museum of Modern Art not Museum of Modern Art New York, the only Museum of Modern Art. And then Thelma Golden, uh, the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Maybe some of you have already attended the duet, the beautiful duet between the two before. And then here is Michael Govan, who's the director of LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. What does it mean to be a citizen? You know, there are many definitions, but just like my big fat Greek wedding, I like to go back to the basics. And I like to think of Aristotle. Citizens are citizens when they're part of a community when, where the happiness of the individual coincides with the happiness of all. It's responsibility, it's rights, it's shared interest. This means that it's not only the city, but also another community that can be really the sphere of influence of the museum. So I would like to start by asking each one of you briefly, what do you think is your community or communities? I'm going to go in order of appearance. So Heidi, please. I would say that our community is anyone who's interested in art. I think that um, we try and have a broadest, the broadest base definition as possible. And you know, I like to say that we believe that art can be for anyone, even though we know it's not for everyone. Lisa. I would say that um, our community is anyone that we are actively engaging or who are actively engaged with us uh, in the process of learning and um, experiencing art. And that starts with artists, and it expands outward to the neighborhood, to the city, to the art community and the, uh, the global sphere. There's not much left after that. I would agree with that. <laughs> uh, you. Know, but it is the pebble in the pond rippling out. I do think that for most of us, especially those of us who deal with contemporary art, our, our communities begin with the artists that we serve and that we believe in. And from that, it extends all the way to those who might never visit our museum, but connect to us uh, via the web or some other means. Yeah, I define uh, my community as both the spatial, the quite literal physical place where I am and where I exist, but also the spiritual, that, that group of people who share, want to share, live in and exist and inspired by the sort of values and ideals that are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as Glenn said, but I, there, there is no one community. And I think one of the things that's interesting about museums and our museum is everything is that there's so many communities and I think one of the best things about a museum is the way it might mix communities or serve as a place for communities of different kinds to meet. Absolutely, but so far you've been all very conceptual and all very correct, but I would like to ask you to imagine yourself as atomic bombs. So there's a blast at the beginning, and then there's like the, you know, the, the burn, and then there's the irradiation, and of course it's not so focused and concentric, but do you believe spatially, geographically, that your context is really always the artist? Your focus? Um, your epicenter? Well, I mean, I you know, think the gift that the founders of the Studio Museum in Harlem gave me is they sort of decided what the center would be. And one would be the artist, the studio. The other would be this physical place, the museum. But also, very importantly, it would be Harlem. So that had to be the epicenter of what it would be. So I think it is a way of thinking about 
all, all of these ideas together. The, the art is obviously, yes, but also place and context being super important. And for you, Michael, I mean, the Los Angeles County, that's how it came to be. It was about Los Angeles. Yeah, it was for Los Angeles to, to have, we were the last city, right? So you have to have a museum to be the center. Um, Los Angeles is a giant, chaotic, multicultural place. And I think what's interesting, I'm the only one here who represents one of these museums that goes back to ancient times. And so um, I, I am artist-centric. And the interesting thing is to apply that to ancient artists as well. That, you know, there's art and artists and, and everything that's, you know, it's all present today. And I think that sense of human beings, it's all constructed and made, is one of the exciting things about the museum. It just, it represents what humans achieve. Mm -hmm. And for you, it's Aspen, so also very localized. Well, you know, it's interesting because there are only four accredited art museums in the entire state of Colorado. So. <laughs> You go to more than four accredited art museums in one day in New York. What does credited so, mean? Accredited. Accredited, yeah, accredited by the American by... Association of Art Museums. Mm -hmm. So, And we're the only one on the western slope of Colorado. So we have, as part of our mission, what I think is kind of a moral sense, is that you know we have to bring art to as many people as we can. So education is a big part of what we do. We're in every school in a two and a half hour driving radius of Aspen, because that's how far we can get in the day and come back again. And so, you know, we, what we do is really different than a place where there's a plethora of, of different museums. So we have a different role to play. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, your museum has always been at the same time very localized, but also very light and very active in terms of advocacy. So how do you position physically your institution? Well, we're embedded in a, a community that's always fostered creativity. So it's, it's a creative center of New York, uh, number one. And number two, it's always historically been the site of social activism and dissent. So uh, we bring those two things together, and that's part of our history. Uh, but we also have a global mission, and we have many, many partners and active curators who are working around the world. So that is as essential a part of our community and a very, very important part. Well, recently you had an exhibition, the Pavel Althammer show, that ended yes. in, in March that was all about the community. It was all about bringing yes. people in and other institutions and letting them draw on your walls. Right. So, what was the civic significance of that? Well, um, it was called The Neighbors. Mm -hmm. So right away it signaled uh, his intention. And this is an artist who works in um, a very socially engaged way. And that's something that, that we like and we embrace. Uh, he invited the members of the audience, or the public, to come in and draw on the walls of the museum. And it was a tremendous success. Here is an artist from Poland who was not well known. This is not a brand name. We didn't think many people would come. Uh, but it turned out to be so successful because, number one, people could put their mark on the wall of the museum. I was a little skeptical about what the result would be even though I thought it was a great project. Um, and it turned out to be so much richer than I ever imagined. Uh, and it evolved over time. It changed every day. And then at the end, uh, he cut up the piece and gave it back to the public so you could come in and identify a piece of the wall that you wanted and take it home with you. And there was such joy and excitement about that. Mm -hmm. So it was very successful. <laughs> Can I, can I <laughs> jump in? Because I think actually, what he was touching on and something that artists like Roman Andak touch on is this incredible hunger that we all have to participate. Yeah, that's right. That, that it's not simply about going to an institution and looking, which is, of course, one of the pleasures of going to a museum. There's another side of that, which is actively participating in the making of a work of art. And by doing that, in a way, inscribing yourself into the texture, fabric, and history of that institution. So for all of those neighbors who participated, it's no longer the new museum. It's their museum. They did something that will forever be part of that institution. And I think there are a lot of artists who've understood this social dimension of, of what they can do with making art, catalyzing these relationships between people and place that actually tie back to the notion of citizenship. Because Absolutely. I think one of the underlying ideas of citizenship, certainly as it's understood in this country, is this notion of participatory democracy. And I think when you get to that level, uh, it's a transformative experience for the institution as well as for the individual. 
Absolutely, and in fact, yesterday in this uh, discussion about arts institutions and communities, one of the points that was made is that the function of these arts institutions is to make people, the public, the citizens, realize their creative power and their potential, which then can set them free. And we see the work of the Astor, for instance, in Chicago and of many other artists really going capillary into the communities. And yesterday, another point that was made is that sometimes museums are not as relevant to people's lives as instead these smaller institutions. Is it almost like a biological uh, problem that uh, museums are too big to penetrate the membrane of the cell of citizens? Or is it something that is, derives from the fact that sometimes we lose connection with uh, the community? Are you itching I, I, to? I would like to just make a general observation mm -hmm. that relates to that, which is that um, arts, in America have had a tremendous impact uh, on our culture in so many ways. And museums are hubs of innovation. They can transform communities. They're economic engines. Um, they connect people with the creative impulse inside of them. They do so many things. And more and more people are coming to museums. We've never had as many museums as we have now. So um, you know, I, don't, I disagree that they're irrelevant. I think, however, um, there is this still uh, uh, under acknowledgement and under leveraging of arts in our country, in spite of the fact that all of the uh, statistics show that more and more people are visiting museums. In fact, more people went to museums, I think, let's see, 800 million last year, as opposed to 180 million that attended sporting events. So, this is museums considered in a very broad sense, but still, people are going and they're engaging and they're enjoying it. But they are under-acknowledged and under-leveraged, and this has to do with three things. It has to do with the fact that we've never really measured our impact in uh, the right ways or gotten that information out in a compelling way. Uh, it has to do with a prejudice that is lingering from our puritanical past, that art is a fraud, that um, it's a frill, it's a sideshow, uh, or at worst, it's dangerous. Um, yeah, I've come to and, believe that the prejudice is strong, stronger than the metrics. Yesterday, yes. actually, Sarah Lewis and I yesterday attended Mark Ben uh, and Wilson Marsteller presentation of the new survey about the world in 2024, where nowhere ever was culture and the visual arts ever mentioned. You know, they were offering this idea of future leadership, you right. know, financial yeah. leaders, exactly. entrepreneurial leaders. There were no cultural leaders. And then they were surprised because the millennials were not so hot right. on, 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 on technological entrepreneurs. So it's, right. it's a prejudice more than a metric. But just, just to end my mm -hmm. thought, because there's a third point that's related that has to do with that prejudice, and that's institutions, the art world's insularity. And that's something that we all talk about, but it does exist. Institutional and insularity. I, yes, I would say the art world in general is quite insular, although there are many art worlds, but. Glenn, what do you think? Well, I think all worlds have their own dimension of insularity, right? I mean, we're. Those of us who, who live in the art world, see each other, talk to each other, do so in code most of the time. And that can seem uh, off-putting. But I, I, I'm just absorbing the, the argument you're, or the idea that you're, you're making. And I, it, of course, you, you speak from your own position. So I don't think museums are irrelevant. Uh, at all. I actually think we're in an ecosystem, though, and I do think that's the important part. That ecosystem covers a wide range of organizations, some of them autonomous and small, some of them mid-sized, some of them very large, and to sort of disaggregate any one aspect of that from the ecosystem is to miss the point that, that the art world is really a, a kind of multi-dimensional series of networks that are constantly shaping and reshaping themselves locally, nationally, and internationally. And I think the danger we have is not to realize that our bubble can be at times uh, impenetrable for some. And when we succeed, we succeed because we find ways of engaging people 
outside our community and create the capacity to welcome them inside that community. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen all the time and I think we have to work harder and harder at it. It's difficult in a culture like ours in this country in which culture itself isn't part of a national agenda. I mean, if you think about it, we don't have a ministry of culture. We don't even have a cultural policy in the United States. So we operate in this very strange liminal zone, most of us. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's something worth talking about at a much broader level. And it's interesting because liminal implies a border that then can be penetrated or not. And one of the discussions yesterday was exactly about how not only accessible but welcoming institutions mm -hmm. are. And Kate Levin was talking about the gate policy that sometimes keeps people out. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's true. I mean, museums are succeeding very much right now, art museums, especially in the United States, the numbers of people, the schools we reach, the economic impact, whole communities are being built around museums now. That's the quickest way if you want an economic engine and everybody's copying it from Bilbao to Abu Dhabi. It's like, put the art museum there and then everyone will build around it. It'll be a tourist attraction, economies will build. But it doesn't mean we couldn't become irrelevant. Like we've seen how fast the world's changing. And I think one of the things people think of as museums, maybe not so much contemporary museums, but that the museum has always existed. Art's been around for 35,000 years, museums for a couple hundred. It's a constantly evolving enterprise, which is what we think about all the time. I think we had a conference recently where we were talking about the fact we couldn't define a museum as, even an art museum as one thing. Because in every community, we kept morphing and evolving our shape to deal with that environment, which we considered maybe bad for marketing the whole enterprise, but good for the sense that we were constantly evolving. And I think there is still some tearing down of walls that has to happen. The, the, and, and I'm not sure it's just a free admission argument. <clears throat> people will pay for what... That was not, it was not money, no, it was not, barriers. It's physical. barriers. It's like people yeah. don't even know. They did a survey in LA about, at one point about, you know, would you look like this kind of show or that kind of show? And the real question people needed to know is like, how, how do I get in? What do I wear? What am I allowed to do? Exactly. Like that's, exactly. there's an audience exactly. of people that exactly. don't even know. And then you go and have a museum. Mm -hmm. And you know, most museums have like giant stone walls. Mm -hmm. Like unless you already know what's inside. So I noticed, Heidi, your museum has a nice glass facade. Glenn's museum is, your museum is being rebuilt with a, glass wall, yours does, but most museums are still stone walls. We're rebuilding our museum to be glass and transparent. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this, what's great about the world right now in museums is they, they are very much into economies, politics, communities, and they're being shaped very diversely. And we may be entering this age where an art museum surely isn't a one thing that, that looks like any other one, but I see us diverging a lot to, um, to meet those communities, however we define them in different places. Well, I think we have to, and, and the we is also a bigger group, because I think that as museums continue to be thought through and developed, they are being thought through and developed by different groups of people who have a completely different definition yeah. right. of but what why? this is meant to be. That's right. mm -hmm. And that's what's exciting about it. Right? That you know, if we speak about community, what we're talking about is respecting deeply the values of community, and with that will come different values for museums. Absolutely. But in truth, um, people who build the museum tend to be usually wealthy patrons that have um, their own interests, and then kind of offer this gift. We were discussing it. I don't want to take this as mine. We were discussing it this morning, and then offer this gift to the masses, which is the old idea of a museum as the cabinet of curiosities and then the uh, didactic mm -hmm. gift to the masses or, or their public. But here in the States, they're mostly the, the former. So how do you, um, as a director, make sure that you can bring together the interests of the elite with the interests and the needs of the world at large? But that's mm -hmm. one of the things yeah. that's amazing about museums, right? Museums, art in general is the great equalizer. So particularly if you take away admission, which we've done, and you know, we're not going to talk about that today as, as uh, whether you should do or you shouldn't do that. But if you take away that particular economic barrier of entry. Why is it the equalizer? So, well, what I think is that you have the opportunity to stand in front of an object. And I think that museums really are about the power of the art object. 
But so why should you? Why should that object be important to everybody? I mean, it's like says who? It, it, it really is still a, a top-down approach, and it's no, not I about. No, it's a horizontal approach because mm -hmm. I think there are lots of different types of art, and I think the idea that there's an opportunity to actually slow down. I think that's actually why museums that's serve good. this great role in communities now, because there's the opportunity to actually disconnect from the immediacy of the need for, contact, for constant contact and communication. And if you're put in front of something that you don't understand, that you think is curious, that you may hate, but somehow it gives you a, a, a frisier between your everyday, then that's where the power of art comes in. And you don't have to like it. Mm -hmm. But you have the opportunity to be in the presence of something which is confusing. And we are so focused on trying to understand everything, compartmentalize everything, have that knowledge, that that is the amazing power of art, is to let us be a little uncertain sometimes, because that's where new ideas can come from. Lisa, you wanted to say? Well, realistically, there is a balancing act that goes on um, between ethos, um, programmatic ambition, Sponsorship, yes, that's for sure. Uh, and, and I think it always will, even when sources of funding change, if they're government, if it's government funding, it carries its own set of dilemmas. If it's crowdsource funding, that's another set of dilemmas, and that's certainly could be coming. Um, well, and we'll see how that changes <laughs> museums. But, yeah. Definitely. Now, I have to say that for Europeans coming here, the idea, you know, I, I remember I didn't know 20 years ago what a trustee was because this does not exist in Europe, and I was seeing these great people, you know, I was meeting Joe Carroll Lauder, I was meeting Patty Cisneros, and I could not understand for the life of me if I was working for them or they were working for me. I could not really get it. I so, can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Do tell. Do tell. <laughs> But I have to say, it's really, it's really quite interesting to be able to balance the act. What about you, Thelma? How does it work? I mean, you're a community museum that at the same time has a universal scope. Really, I think of you as the mm -hmm. antenna at the end of the Rocky Horror mm -hmm. Picture Show. It's mm -hmm. like going everywhere. Well, it's, you know, it's the beauty of this mandate to be a museum of artists of African descent. It allows us to be truly international because we're really talking about, you know, sort of the global black experience, which is what it is. Um, but at the same time, being able to root that in very specific ways in a community that has its own very profound mythology. Um, mm -hmm. that's real and, and lasting and tangible does create this uh, you know, ability to be sort of super local but incredibly global right. at the same moment. But in some ways, that's not just a function of the museum, that's a function of sort of contemporary New York in many ways as well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, that you can have you know, this incredible cosmopolitanism, right? Inherent in our city, but also really where locality and localness and the sense of neighborhood can be um, definitive to local, identity. global, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I would like to talk about the network of museums. I mean, more and more, the world is becoming a network of cities. You know, mayors are becoming so important, and cities are becoming so important, and states often kind of uh, uh, legislate the connecting tissue, you know, and uh, also museums have alliances and connections. How do you see, you were talking before about an ecology. I'm gonna start asking you, Michael, where do you see LACMA in this network of museums, possibly not only in the northern western hemisphere, quadrosphere, um, quartosphere. Yeah, just to say, just on the system that we have of <clears throat> patronage, just to answer that though, it, mm -hmm. it's a fantastic system that we can produce this out of people who give freely and who knows where it's going to go. And it has a lot, it can go awry, but it's a fantastic system. And I think the museums are actually quite advanced <laughs> in many ways. Uh, one of them is their global networks. Like we trade works and know people around the world in our jobs just every day. Mm -hmm. And we're always trading works. The currency of our success depends on whether you know what's going on globally. So compared to a lot, I mean, like corporations, but corporations that are multinational mm -hmm. extend across the globe mm -hmm. and they own everything. We're small but always trading. And I think that there is inherent a sense of understanding across cultures in museums that's quite fantastic. I mean, we take a lot of things for granted about that cross-cultural understanding mm -hmm. in museums because it's, it's daily life. And I think that's one of the things we like to share is that excitement of difference 
across cultures and the ability to exchange and trade regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lisa. I think that um, art offers, and contemporary art, offers an amazing opportunity for cross-cultural dialogue and um, a platform for having discussion, opening up, understanding curiosity, questions, uh, dialogue, and tolerance for different points of view, different cultural perspectives. We're super committed to that. And as a mid-size institution, without a collection, um, we have extended our reach and our impact through various uh, collaborations that we undertake with partners across the globe. So we have, I counted, six different collaborative initiatives going on right now. And uh, it's really transformed uh, all of us uh, within the museum and the museum itself. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can build on that, and it's nice to remember uh, back in the 70s and 80s when the Cold War was ending, one of the big breakthroughs that was discovered at a political level was that throughout the period of the Cold War, most of the Soviet museums had maintained relationships with their American counterparts. Right. Real exchanges. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when, when things finally started to crack under Gorbachev in the yeah. late 80s, what did we discover? We discovered that Boris Piotrowski had been welcoming Americans uh, to the Hermitage very quietly, but nonetheless, there was a network of people yeah. that had been uh, actively involved in exchanging ideas, in respecting each other's practices, in recognizing that political systems come and go. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think when you, when you move it up to 20,000 feet and start thinking about the networks that uh, both you and Michael were talking about, but also remembering networks are people. Right. Yeah, talking yeah. to yeah. each other. So that combination of curiosity, which is embedded in what we do, I think anyone who comes to or works in a museum is inherently curious, combined with a recognition that there isn't a culture, there are many cultures, and that builds this notion of tolerance, allows us to establish relationships even with people and societies that we are officially opposed to or even at war with. And I actually think we serve a remarkable purpose at that yeah. scale of ensuring that the things that really matter, right. like civilization and humanity, can be discussed at a level that ultimately when the surface changes can regroup in new and interesting ways. That's and you good. think about the ways in which even in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking now, right at the moment of the Taliban before the United States got involved, there were already scholars on the ground yeah. working with people in Afghanistan to try and find ways to mm -hmm. salvage uh, what was still there. These things aren't forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they may take 20 years or 40 years to fully germinate, mm -hmm. but those individual connections are part of what we do. Lisa. Yeah, and again, I feel that the potential of art institutions to foster this cross-cultural dialogue is under leverage. It is such an important function, and it's never been more important than now. Um, we experienced 9-11 up close, and it had a huge impact on our thinking and, and on our institution. Uh, just, you know, the, the shock of that day and uh, the shock and, and realization that there were groups out there that hated us that much. We didn't know who they were. Who are these people? We immediately formed connections with institutions throughout the Middle Eastern region and started to have that dialogue. And, and then we invited an artist named Jeremy Deller to do a project called um, It Is What It Is, Conversations About Iraq, where he brought in a car um, that had been bombed in the center of, of Baghdad and then staged continuous conversations with both Iraqis and Americans who had served in Iraq about their experience of being there. And, uh, you know, and people said, well, is this art? Is this really art? You know, how is this art? Uh, but it was one of the most powerful things I think that we've done, so. Mm -hmm. right. And I think the question Example. wasn't necessarily was it art, but more importantly the question was, is this a good and important place for a museum to be, to convene? And I think the answer, of course, is yes. So when we're talking about this museum as citizen, that's a perfect example, Lisa, of how, as a citizen, your institution heeded the call to create some space for the kind of dialogue that was necessary in a very tense, intense moment in the city and in the world. 
Yeah, and one of the many metaphors that, are, that have been used for museums is also the forum, the agora, the convening place. Mm -hmm. You were talking about convening dialogues. So um, this idea of a place that allows people to come together, is that also what you're thinking of for the Aspen Art Museum? Is that something that placemaking remained in your mind? I think it is. And you know, the way that we can have impact is various, right? To, to have Jeremy have those conversations, that's a very overt way to, to make a statement, right? And Jeremy actually sat on the same stage with some people who had served in Iraq and had uh, these very emotional conversations, yeah, and, yeah. and that was very impactful too. So there's the more overt way, and then there's the more kind of subversive way, where the artists that we choose to show, the people who we invite to speak, the conversations that we have, that establishes a dialogue and, and what kind of intentional impact that we're creating. And I think that's the most interesting effect of art. I mean, setting aside the impact of the aura of the art object and its ability to move people, you know, the, the secondary, probably most important thing is then what we think about it and how we share that with other people. And the idea that a conversation with someone can change profoundly, not just the way you see that individual object, but the way you see yourself and then the way you see the world. And that's the great privilege that we have to be having these platforms to be able to pose those types of conversations. Now, in most cities, museums as citizens are prominent citizens, you know, like, like they're high up in the whole pecking order of the city. So they have to deal directly, usually, with the boss, with the mayor. So I wanted to ask you, what is your relationship with the city, with the county? I mean, you're a county museum, but how do you negotiate? Do you push them towards certain programs? How much do you lobby, whether behind the scenes or in front? Um, it's interesting, Los Angeles, I guess, because it was a late museum, but it, of a big kind, it needed subsidies from the government. <clears throat> As Los Angeles, even, you know, the Met was in New York, was 1860, whatever, we're 1965. We're younger than most, I think, certainly younger than the Museum of Modern Art. So there was this big involvement from the county, and that's why we're the county museum, and everybody says that's a strange name, county, but Los Angeles County is 10 million people. It's a super diverse, multicultural place. And I find the government involvement quite welcoming because to argue for a variety of support. On one hand, you have to argue to the government on certain terms and then like people and their benefit in a clear way. On the other hand, you're arguing to patrons. And I think the more audiences you have to win over, the stronger the program mm -hmm. can be. And generally in LA, there's a famous story where the supervisors in 1967, the museum was new, tried to shut down the museum over a Ed Keenholz installation, was, which was too risque. And so they said, it, um, so the solution was, of course, this made the exhibition the most popular exhibition course, on the like, West like Coast. Like sensation. At that time, <laughs> the there were lines around the block as much as for the Mona Lisa when yes, it came. Yes, of course. Um, but, you know, that was a mistake, obviously, but uh, good for the museum in some senses. But they've, they've, LA's a good model. It's a hybrid of public and private support. Mm -hmm. And I think government involvement is quite welcome. I wish we had more government involvement, actually, because I think arguing these different cases to different kinds of uh, people is, is good. I know MoMA has zero government support, yeah. right? That's Practically. kind of a choice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, I mean, we were founded as a private institution by a small group of people who believed New York needed a place uh, that could show the most um, the terms that they used progressive art being made um, at the time. And over the years, we, we never had a logical relationship with government. Although, like every museum in this country, we benefit from tax uh, subsidies at a federal level that enable individuals to derive a benefit from contributing to our programs. But much as I would like to have a relationship with government, because I agree entirely with Michael, the more constituents you serve, the more engaged you are with your public. And, and having to respond to those constituents keeps you honest in a way. Yeah. But we have such a fraught relationship in this country at a political level with issues like contemporary art. We did, in fact, make the choice to avoid government funding because there have been so many instances of that blowing up uh, and then derailing the energy of that institution, even if it has the reverse effect of turning whatever the cause that sparked 
the ire of a politician into the most celebrated and popular cause imaginable. It isn't worth the agony. Uh, so ours is a bit of a tactical decision, but the reality is that when you, when you do look at the American landscape, there are a large number of privately funded institutions. There are actually a number of federally funded institutions. And then there's a wide range in between. County funded. In New York, we have <coughs> the Cultural Industries Group, which I think is 30 or 38 strong, mm -hmm. uh, of which the Studio Museum is one. And those are institutions that do receive support from the city of New York. So we have, a, uh, I think, a rich hybrid texture to the way in which culture is served. But I really want to underscore that the miracle of this country is the degree to which private initiatives are prepared to support a public good. If you just think about that, uh, it is an astounding, an utterly astounding achievement. Uh, and it's one that every major country, and certainly every yes. major European country, mm -hmm. that has a long history of government yeah, support, that actually zero. believes yeah. that government should be the primary supporter of culture. Every one of those countries is trying to figure out how to yeah. inculcate right. the sense yeah. of, of commitment and citizenship mm -hmm. that so many in this country believe in. And I really, I can't say it strongly enough. When you talk about citizenship, it's also the fact that those who are privileged are willing to share with those who are not. Mm -hmm. And we, places like the Museum of Modern Art, the New Museum and others, are an absolute result of that. That's absolutely true. And I was thinking also of other types of relationships with politicians. But you're right. Those who have a lot are willing to share. But now, let's talk about those who have not and how willing they are to come to the museum. Like, you know, so why should people come to the museum? That was another question that we asked this morning. So generosity from uh, the small percentage and the rest of the percent needing to make a decision whether, and it's not a money decision, it's more of a time and allotment of resources. So why do people go to museum or why should they? Little question, who wants to tackle it? Well, Lisa. The, museum, <laughs> the museum is now um, not only a place that you go to, uh, but it's, it's a number of platforms, at least at the New Museum and in many others. Uh, it, it's programs outside of the museum, off-site, on-site, online, uh, so there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of gateways, uh, and a lot of different kinds of audiences that are engaged. So it's not anymore about the building itself, no. but it's being no. an impresario in the city almost. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mama? I think in, in a way our ability or our necessity to be in our, inside our institutions but also offering them in a broad way is how we can operate as a citizen. For those of us who do get public funding in a significant way, there is a, a real important responsibility that comes with that, right? Mm -hmm. To serve widely um, in ways that aren't just how we might define ourselves traditionally around our missions. Mm -hmm. To look at ourselves as partners in our city, not just you know, more generally to provide audience, but partners to our educational structures, partners to our social service structures, partners to the healthcare structure in providing the services that they are very importantly giving to uh, communities. So it's a museum really as a citizen, not just in the building around art, but out in the community as a member of that and community. And you were saying before in the, in the dialogue between you and Glenn, you were saying that what keeps you up at night, amongst mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. is the preoccupation with having true impact. Well, yeah. being able to do that effectively and importantly, mm -hmm. and to be able to sort of understand what um, that needs to mean and, and who you're doing it for. I mean, Can I you give me an example, a concrete example of something, a program that you've done that has had an impact that you feel proud of because it's gone where you wanted it to go? Um, sure. You know, one of the things um, that we were experiencing Harlem is a kind of social scientist um, idea of this naturally occurring retirement community, that is communities where people are aging in place. So we in Harlem had a lot of people who were not just considered old, but what they call the old, old uh, people over 80. There were not enough services for them, particularly those living with Alzheimer's and dementia. And one of the biggest issues there was about creating spaces for them and their caregivers to have other kinds of experiences. And um, the museum wholeheartedly jumped in 
into the sort of partnership to create what could be in our space at first, which, which would not just be an art experience, but an experience that was working, again, deeply with the social work community mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. We're really just try, trying to address a very profound public health issue, yeah. right? And I think, <clears throat> I think it ranges from the everyday. For mm -hmm. whatever reason, art museums are quite advanced in thinking about their position in communities. Maybe it's because we're so visible and so there's a lot of scrutiny and so, and we think about it a lot. But I think there are examples from art and health being in, in poor public schools. Mm -hmm. But there are also overarching things that art museums can do that are, are beyond daily service. I mean, I think about, for example, art museums are generally a European construction. And so there's a little bit of a privilege to how you know, European point of view on the world, but we live in a global society where, you know, there aren't um, encyclopedic art museums in China or in Asia. Uh, there are a lot of contemporary art museums, but that idea that the museum may be able to rebalance worldviews, like that you don't have to walk in and see Greece and Rome as the beginning point of civilization as is pretty much the foundation of every thinking about a museum. If you can walk into a museum and it's ancient America, for example, and the museum's a giant museum, so you take it seriously. Yeah. Those kinds of worldview changing things are things museums are well capable of doing that you can't really find another medium to do that, uh, I think, as easily. Wait, Lisa wanted to do something, and then I can see that you're itching to the end. So just um, to your question, and to the point made earlier about the mandate that I feel we all have to advocate for culture as essential, um, we decided to start our own festival, uh, which looks at the future of cities with culture as an important driving force for the vitality of cities. It's called Idea City. And um, we, through this program, we work with mayors all over the world. We work with city officials in New York very closely. Uh, and we work across sectors. And I think that's such an important thing for us all to think about doing. And we, we're all doing it in some form, um, to work across sectors. and. I would love to see that happen here at the Aspen Institute. Which too. sectors are you thinking of? Well, we work in government. Oh, uh, I see we work doing. with uh, technologists. We yeah. work with architects and designers, uh, with thought leaders. You know, a whole range, scientists, and uh, we're thinking. But artists are always at the table, and that's an important thing because that's what makes what we do different. Art is the starting point, and. Artists should have a seat at the table. It's been amazing to see how embracing and welcoming these other sectors are of artists, how they love to have the interaction and dialogue and want to learn from artists, as we all have. So. Michael, you want to say something? Well, I was just saying, yeah, I agree with you completely. And it is astounding how little art is taken into the centrality of politics. And so many times I'm at places like this and you're hearing people on panels and you're thinking, oh, well, I, you can find the answer to that in culture. Oh, you can find the answer to that in culture. Artists know how to take disparate amounts of information and see creative ways to reorganize that for future use. Like, and, and we know that every day. And it is for all the good of how this country has created museums out of the largesse of a few. It's, it is astounding how little the government and uh, how little it's considered practical, exactly. which well, it is has to be, It has odd. to be part of the good society, right? I mean, the whole idea that museums would somehow be irrelevant is, you know, for me, absurd, because museums are an essential part of, of the good society. They're Laura like didn't say that they were irrelevant. They, she was well, just saying a, sometimes they're a little removed. About it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you need, we need as a good society, and that's what the Aspen Institute is also about founding, museums just like we need libraries and we need hospitals and you know that's part of if we're not advocating well enough for the services that we provide as good citizens then we're not doing the job that we should be doing mm -hmm. but we should we shouldn't forget that with art museums and this is not a universal truth but it's largely true that the primary drivers of those who attend art museums are education and affluence it's not the only there are other drivers and we should be acutely aware, I, I feel in this country, that education is not evenly distributed. Um, and that is a huge problem. And wealth is especially asymmetrically distributed. And when you have those two forces actually pulling away from uh, each other, 
we in the museum world need to really think about how to ensure Absolutely. that what we offer, uh, anyone, is in fact accessible to mm -hmm. those who don't or aren't fortunate enough to have access to those qualities that or privileges that enable them to enjoy what we do. And I, I do think this is a very big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I think about often is, so a group of people who are affluent and privileged are prepared to support or create institutions for a large number of people. But in effect, we have to make sure the codes that we inadvertently send out about what we do and how we do it don't turn people off or intimidate yeah. them. And this is actually a very big issue. And I, I know a lot of people who have done a lot of work trying to figure out how to break through that education affluence uh, barrier. And it's not so easy to do. And, it, and the, we talk about it all the time, about public education, the need for reform. But we're, we see a society in which the one-tenth of one percent, the one percent, even the five percent, are cleaving apart from the rest of our culture. And that's not good news for us. Uh, and I don't know that we can play a role in reshaping it, but I think we have to be acutely aware that if we're going to serve society well, we have to be inclusive and ensure that we can reach out to new underserved audiences and ensure that they are as welcome and as interested in what we do as is humanly possible. Yeah, good point. And I think that's a huge, huge very, challenge. Very well, it's huge. the point that Thelma made in your earlier conversation. Museums, in terms of our staffs, um, need to rec we need to appropriately reflect our communities and the diversity of, of our country. And that's, you know, that's a really important step to take. We not, need not just reflect it, but we have the opportunity to get ahead of the reflection that others can have. I mean, yes. you know, on this issue of inequality, it's one that you know, when we start talking about, you know, underserved audiences, it's one that in the museum field we are not so willing to talk about right? <coughs> and not so willing to acknowledge, right, in real terms. And I think that it's where we do have some freedom to really be transformative in the right. field. Yeah. Right. And I think that we know certain institution models that have been created out of that transformation. That's where this idea of where new museums are going to come from. Some are going to come out of this. Yeah sort of context, and that's what's so important that we not just acknowledge what you say, Glenn, but that we take that as core mission. And I wonder if they'll mission. still be called museums. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, open up for very incisive, great questions. Look inside <laughs> yourselves and really give me the best of yourselves. There's one here. <clears throat> um, my name's Gary Davis. I'm the chairman of the Johnson Museum in Ithaca, New York. And the discussion has been very big city centric with yeah. the exception yeah. of the Aspen Museum, which also caters to an incredibly sophisticated crowd. So I'd just like you to address perhaps museums as citizens in small towns like Ithaca, New York, where they play an incredibly important role. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're 100% correct. We've heard that recently, but increasingly you're seeing museums used as tools of innovation in small cities. I learned to become interested in museums. I hated big museums. I loved art. Uh, but it, in um, North Adams, Massachusetts, which was a down and out city in northwestern Massachusetts, and we argued where Glenn knows well. His family was from near there. But, um, and we argued for money from the government to, to build a museum, transform a, a fa factory that was no longer in use into an art museum. And it's, it's worked in, in a lot of ways. And I think that. That is actually well understood in a lot of cities across America that art museums that can mix local audiences and draw some tourism dollars. Um, and that we shouldn't, there was, a, I think 10, 15 years ago, people would say, oh, we can't get economics mixed up in art or in art Ooh. museums. But now it's just given. You, you don't have a reason to exist if you're not doing that. And I think many small cities see the value of it building social capital. And actually, I don't know if you have had a chance to meet Deb Fallows during these days. She's, uh, she and Jim Fallows are doing a research about small cities in the United States, and they were talking about Eastport, Vermont, and museum mm -hmm. there. OK, next question. There is a lady with the white hat. Oh, yeah, you can, you can give it to this lady here in the middle, and then, I'll, and then the lady with the white hat, and then I'll make sure to look at the corners. 
Uh, my name is Allison Zeno, and um, art education is very important to me and for many reasons. What role as education in especially public schools and the arts dies and dies and dies? What role will museums play going forward very concretely? If you can give me examples of your museums, what roles will you have and will you be able to take over some of the burden of continuing to educate Heidi, you, you wanted to answer that. Heidi, you yeah, we're, we're doing that. Um, when I came to Aspen, the previous approach was to try and get into the art classrooms. Well, they don't really exist anymore. Um, if there is even an art teacher, it's maybe shared between multiple schools. Um, so what we did was we looked at third grade, because that's where they start doing testing, and we looked at the third grade standards, and we tried to figure out what we could actually teach so that they didn't have to. So we focused on scale and mass primarily. We go into the classrooms, we bring scale models of the museum, scale model of the artworks, talk to them about the things they need to teach anyway, then bring them back to the museum. We do it 100% at our cost. So we pay for the teachers, we pay for the buses, we pay for um, the gas, and when we have our new museum, we'll pay for their lunches. And um, so what we did is we tried to figure out what they needed to teach anyway, and then took that burden off their plate, so they've been very welcoming to that, and we've had huge success with that. Lisa, did you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Um, we focus primarily on high school students, and uh, we have a program called the Global Classroom. We do a lot of teacher training and um, curriculum development through textbooks that we publish and on-site training, as well as uh, work in the classroom and students coming to the museum, um, and working in a sustained way over time. So they also go into internship programs, and they work um, after, after they've gone through the class. Yeah, can I? I yeah, you can all go. You can, I will go. Again. We just shouldn't kid ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. All of these programs, and, and Heidi's, uh, Lisa's, ours, Thelma's, Michael's, all of these programs are a gloss. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're a gloss. We cannot touch significantly enough, enough students to really make yeah. a difference. And everyone here and all of your friends shouldn't take this uh, sitting down. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a real cleavage in our culture from those who are privileged enough through their education to learn about art, music, dance, symphony, whatever, and those who are not. And while we may be able to provide programs that touch a number of people episodically, it is just a fundamentally different yes. thing than when the arts are part of a curriculum. So I, I just feel so frustrated by all of this. And we make our best effort. We touch hundreds of thousands of kids a year, but we don't touch them every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just think we shouldn't kid ourselves about what has been taken away from those children. I, I feel that we are often filling a gap as programs get cut back. That but, but, we are filling a void, and yes, it's it's, it's grossly insufficient. It's, it's, like water. it's grossly insufficient. It's, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> it's water I'm just on saying a that hot it's, rock. It's, it's not. Even, it's, you can't. I, we spend a million and a half dollars. It's a year. It's so few. And partly, I think the the phrasing has to change. And by the way, we've become successful, and arts are being just taken out of every school. There's this idea that arts education is education about the arts. Right. I think we have to yeah, change yeah. that to art is education. That's right. right. Exactly. It is education. Yeah, right. Thelma wants to say something. Yeah, that's true. Right. 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 And, I, and I think, though, in our field, that while it's right, we should all make all the efforts we do around arts education. We have to be more embedded in the fight for. Yeah. really good quality public education. And as arts leaders, not in that larger dialogue, it's where we won't get more education that includes the arts, but also just better schools in general. I mean, I think what most of us see in this sort of, you know, sort of poor quality public education, that it's a set of circumstances that also need to be addressed. That's the in-school time, the out-of-school time, the lack of all these various programs. And while we can address them in some ways, it's really, I think, my experience has been our voice in the bigger conversation that really has the power to make real change. Thank you. Lady with the white hat. No. Uh, as a docent at my local museum, um, I was going to ask you how when we bring these kids in and you can tell you're really touching them, you can tell they really like it, they really get into it, they ask good questions, they have good answers. Mm -hmm. Who wants to and, answer? Oh. And how do you follow up on that? And I think <coughs> basically answers the question. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want to take it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer programs with teens that, sorry, <laughs> uh, which is tremendously empowering, where they're not only coming in to learn, but they're leading the learning. And um, they're leading tours, and they're organizing seminars, and they're or organizing programs for their peers. And with social networking now, that's even more uh, tremendous potential there. OK, the lady with the orange sky. Hi, my name is Terry, and I'm from Santa Barbara. And um, I'm interested in asking you about the idea of expression. And I think the power of expression, especially in our contemporary lives these days, has a lot of power. And um, so interactive, interactive things from you people are very important. And when you talked about your project with people getting involved and taking something away, I think it had a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about you, who is opening this new museum with a pretty uh, target market who live here, you know, an elitist, elitist market, that you might have the most power of all of them, everybody, because they are, you're, you're centrally located, and you can have you, all can these you give people us a question? who are gonna walk by. A question. So the question is, is how do you feel your location is okay. effective in, in how people can come in and feel welcome? Do you want to take it? Uh, I mean, we react sort of negatively to the idea of being elitist, frankly. Um, I mean, I, I think being a contemporary art museum, that's your first hurdle, is the idea that there's a, a broader based um, idea of inaccessibility of contemporary art, but we've done everything we can, including making admission free so that people can't say that we're elitist. Um, I think one of the powers, though, of being in Aspen is the fact that people are drawn here magnetically uh, from a variety of places, and then whatever it is that they consume here, participate in, engage in, they take back with them to wherever else it is that they live. I'm and I think take that viral um, transmission is actually one of the great sources of power, and so I would agree with you. Um, hi, my name's Danielle, and I used to work at a museum in Los Angeles, and I'm really interested in what you were saying, Michael, about this report that was done to kind of show how people are intimidated to enter the museum and kind of like addressing this issue of inequality in education, and yet at the same time, Glenn, your museum is so enormously expensive to gain entry to, so I'm wondering, like, are there other ways, is it virtually to like broaden your audience or? Okay, got the question. So broadening audience, mm -hmm. accessibility, museum price. You know, mm -hmm. it is true that accessibility is the big issue right now and it's not just, price is people will pay, they pay for cell phones, they'll pay for movies. The question is how do you make them feel the worth? And then most museums that charge admission also have a lot of people coming for free. I mean, I don't know how many people come yeah. for free at um, but We charge admission, but over half or almost half the people come for free. You know, you have programs where kids can sign up for free under 17. They can bring an adult for free. The idea is to give some pride to the child that they're the one taking the parent. Um, you know, the idea is you put a museum in a park. We're just now, I think, inventing more and more ways to try to figure that out. I, I, free admission is great, but I don't think that's the fundamental barrier when people don't even know what's inside in certain big yeah, environments I mean, and cities. Access and welcome are two different things. Yeah. And I think that while you know we can make institutions free, we can sort of create all sorts of ideas internally of what then we're taking away a barrier, we are not acknowledging that some of these barriers are bigger. Yeah. And they're cultural. And until cultural. our institutions shift to create a wider embrace, right, one that sort of equalizes different experiences of the museum, um, you know, we work with an amazing program at the Studio Museum called Cool Culture that works with low income families who are on public assistance. And the real issue there for those parents is. They, the, the experience of what you do when you get to a museum, what is the experience, what are the codes that one needs to know just to even get to your free admission are not there for many people in our society. So our ability to create access is fantastic, but we also have to create real spaces of authentic and powerful, respectful welcome in our institutions for all communities to experience that. This beautiful. Thank you.
I'm, I'm very sorry. This is a beautiful way to end, and I have to end because we're at the end of our time. So I apologize to those of you who had your hand up. But I would like to end by quoting something that Thelma said at the previous session when she mentioned a, poor, a, a painting by Glenn Ligon that was uh, quoting Muhammad Ali when speaking to an audience that asked him, give us a poem, he answered, me, we. This is what museums are. They are part of a community that is at the same time local and global, and they identify themselves with a community, and that's how we should envision them, building social capital and building culture for the future. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much.